Okay, so for people who haven't answered already, a couple new folks, can you give me like five seconds of your practical compiler experience? Yeah, I'm asking you. I'm sorry? Have you had a compiler course in college 20 years ago? Have you worked on a compiler yourself directly? Have you heard the word before? Got it. OK. No, you don't work. OK. That, that, that's the common answer I've gotten from about everybody here. So you on the right with the phone, what, what, what's your practical expire, compiler experience? You know, so, sort of, I took a college course 20 years ago. I work on it every day. You work with a compiler. OK, which, which, what kind of compiler? The JDK, so Java C or a hotspot? The, 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 you don't know. So when you say you work with a compiler, you're a user of a compiler. So, okay, so you know what a compiler is supposed to do. Yeah, but not necessarily how they work. Okay, this is very much a common theme here. Okay, so I'm going to give a soft start, and then probably we're going to be time, and I'll, I'll roll. Um, the, the, the common level of experience in the audience seems to be that they, at one time or another, took a compiler course, and uh, uh, most people probably know they're using a compiler in their daily lives, no matter what happens. And uh, very few people seem to have practical experience with making a compiler work, like how they actually do what they do. And, I, and, and just to forewarn everybody here, uh, I intended this talk to be for people who are active practicing compiler engineers interested in working on the core guts of C2. And this is what I presented at uh, 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 Joker in St. Petersburg, and it totally worked. Um, at this point, for this audience, it's not the right kind of talk. Um, but this is what I was invited to come give a talk about. Okay, so I will do so. Um, and let me roll forward, and I'll take it kind of slow for a little while here, and we'll, we'll have some discussions about what's the right level that you can take something away with, right? So who am I? I, I am Cliff Click. Um, I have been second in command of uh, any number of startups now, um, including ones I've done myself, which I guess I was first in command on, and a bunch of others that other people were starting with, and I was the technical guy that came in. I have been 45 years coding and 40 years doing compilers. I built my first one when I was 15. I fell in love with it. Um, distributed computation for 35 years. It was a Z80 mob, for those of you who even ever heard of the word Z80. Uh, device drivers, operating systems, high performance computing, of course, hotspot for a long time. Core guts to the Java virtual machine, including obviously C2, but also at Azul Systems, low latency GC, custom Java hardware, a bunch of non blocking algorithms to support very high concurrency levels. Uh, in the last decade, machine learning tool building, uh, machine learning applications, data science work a lot. I have dozens of papers and 20 odd patents, and I do hundreds and hundreds of public talks. In fact, I have two more at this conference besides this one. And at some point, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make you move because you're, you're too in my face in this room. <laughs> okay, so we're, I'm gonna roll the clock back to 1997, right? So there's plenty of static ahead of time compilers. What's that mean? Well, back in 97, it was the normal. And so you didn't have to have a name for them. It was just a compiler. And, and that meant it was something, it was a tool that you used on the command line. Like today, you might use Java C. And you'd bury it into your build system, which back then would be make, maybe instead of Gradle, but same kind of idea. Um, very slow to generate code, but it would generate very good code. Machines were a thousand times slower, so you wanted the better code, and it was worth it. Plenty of interpreted languages, too, because the extra compilation step's always kind of a clunky thing. So a lot of languages are you want to type and go and type and go and type and go at a, at a REPL, read eval, print loop, including, say, Python. Um, some more blended languages, like Forth, but in that era, uh, Smalltalk was nosing around, and people were having these concepts of better ways of having an interactive programming experience. But 
these other compilers would only ever do template style code generation. What's that mean? They would read a little tiny piece of your text and emit a little tiny piece of code to match. One to one, match to match to match. Faster than interpreting by like 2x, slower than compiled code by 5x. So uh, not nearly as good. I want to do a fast and good compiler. I've got pulled into Sun to make Java go fast. And my PhD thesis, in fact, was on how to do a fast optimizing compiler. And in any of these kinds of things, if you want to go fast, uh, size always matters. It's not the Godzilla, it's the other way around. Small is fast. The smaller you go, the faster you go, until some very tiny limit. Um, and so you need a tiny IR, which uh, doesn't mean a simple IR, it can be very subtle, but it does mean it has to be tiny. And I just said IR, and what's that? We're gonna get to it in just a second. So 22 years later, I left Sun and was still Sun. And uh, you know, for this audience, maybe you don't care. Um, my knowledge is dated. I haven't looked at what Sun folks and then Oracle did to C2 in the last 20 years. But I know from looking at the OpenJDK code that pretty much it's untouched. It's the same stuff's in there that I wrote 20 years ago. Very clear lineage from the code I walked in from my PhD at Rice University where I did an optimizing compiler and brought it over to Sun and said, hey, I can make Java go fast with this. So maybe I have some dated stuff and some wrong stuff, but if none of you are practicing C2 engineers, you'll never know. Um, but mostly I think it hasn't changed. In fact, it still has a directory name that when I was a grad student, I had to pick a name for my project. That's the name that's now in the OpenJDK code 22, to, 22 years later. So this was intended to be in a compiler talk for practicing compiler engineers. And there's a lot of jargon words here, including IR, which is intermediate representation. Static single assignment, graph rewrite rules, optimization passes like dead code elimination, global constant propagation, global value numbering, range tech elimination, inlining, unrolling, what the hell goes on and on and on. So this was intended to be a hardcore compiler talk. I say was, and we'll cover it in just a second. And I'm apologizing where I say no apologies because this was the talk I was invited to give but a query of the audience shows that about three quarters of you admitted to having a compiler course once in your lives and knowing you're using a compiler. It's not necessarily the right level for this talk. There's a lot of jargon here, fairly specific to compilers, some of which I explain in slides, some of which I expect you to get, like out of this graduate level textbook, modern one on compilers. So this is more about the design philosophy of a compiler. Um, and it's targeted for those who are hacking C2 and are trying to understand it in more detail or in compilers like C2. There's a nice high-level overview that makes sense for a broader audience uh, in this paper here. Um, somebody raised their hand? No? So, so let, me, let, me, let, me, let me decide, let me ask people, how would you want to proceed from here? The obvious thing to do is I just carry through with this talk and I will have a lot of jargon I'll pull out. And for you to get the most you can out of it, you should stop me and ask me if you don't understand. And that's just normal. Almost surely if you don't get it and you ask, somebody else isn't getting it either and so they'll also get a win. So it'll be a general win. Otherwise I'll tend to roll forwards and I'll probably leave some people behind and I don't want to do that. So with that in mind, uh, I'll, I'll get rolling here. So compiler IRs, back when I started, were a very different structure. And I uh, built a thing that is used in C2 that I called the sea of nodes back then, and that name has stuck around forever and a day. And other people have picked it up now, but this is a thing I came up with 20 odd years ago as a grad student. The, the compiler's intermediate representation is a way to represent a program that you can then manipulate the program semantics, the meaning of the program, directly. It is a direct, uh, uh, mo directly modifiable representation of the program that we're going to show you in a second. And the reason to do it this way is because manipulating Java text as a way of manipulating a program is like really painful. So you want to change it from Java, in the case of a JVM, from Java bytecodes, Bytecodes are also a painful way to manipulate a program into some other form, and that's the IR. Okay, so what is that form? It is, it is a graph. It is nodes and edges. It's 
SSA form, what's SSA form? Static single assignment. I can talk about it more in the next slide or I'll give you an example. For speed, I said it has to be very small. Why very small or why is small fast? Because small fits in your L1 cache, which is 10 times faster than your L2 cache, which is 10 times faster than your L3 cache, which is maybe 10 times faster than main memory. There's a thousand one ratio floating around in there, a little bit more or less according to where you're at in there. Each layer in your cache hierarchy is 10 times bigger and 10 times slower than the layer before it. So if you want to have a fast compiler because it's running at runtime, you have to be small to fit in your caches. So very little data. So there's semantics of the program, but the minimal amount of data necessary to represent program semantics. And edges, those are direct pointers for, for speed. And direct pointers has an implication that I have a graph with no labels on the edges because the edges are literally raw pointers and there ain't no bits to put any data on them. Data and control use the same graph. If you're into compilers, this means a lot. If you're not in compilers, you may not care. The graph is strongly typed. The type system has everything that Java has for types and a whole lot more things that Java does not have for types because it's what I want to do with the program that I need the types for. I need everything that Java can do, but I want to do further optimizations after that. And then the compiler itself is very loosely coupled to the runtime. It is always the case that there are threads that are running your code interpreted. They're reading a bytecode doing it, reading a bytecode doing it at a certain speed, and the jitted code will be 10 times faster. But the jitting takes a while, so the jit is kicked off on another core on a multiprocessor. Maybe several JITs are running in parallel with maybe several threads interpreting in parallel. And so at the start of a program, a lot of cores will get busy doing things to make code while running the code. So here's a graph. In fact, here's two of them. And I'm going to do a little breakdown for people who are not sort of compiler folks. I don't have the Java code you might see, but you can almost see Java code here. Wow, this is tough. So this is a classic control flow graph and basic block, and that's what compilers did back when I started. And the sea of nodes is in the middle here is somewhat different. So let me break this one down because you can kind of read Java code. I equals zero, A equals read a keyboard thing. I, what's this funny thing? Let's skip it. B equals A plus one, I equals I plus B, C equals I plus two, da 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 da, whatever it's gonna do, return. So there's a loop. The loop includes this. This would be called a basic block. There's no control flow changes in a basic block. It's just straight line code. That's why it's called a basic block of code. There are three basic blocks in this program. It's kind of whatever it's going to do. And there's some control flow looping around. In the sea of nodes, I have a control flow. You can kind of pick it out. But I have data in green, this in yellow, and they're blended together. And we're going to talk more about how I got there, uh, what it means in a second. But there are some papers on how I got there and uh, why it carries program semantics. Here's just the control part making a loop. There's a start. It happens to be the end for convenience. I can walk the graph in either direction. There's a region for merging control from any sort of diamond split, including loops. And there's an if to split control in and out. There's a call which is serialized. There's these funny things after the call called a projection. We'll get to in a second. And there's not an obvious basic block anymore. Why? Because most data ops don't care. They have program semantics. You wrote A sub I plus plus, right? The, the I plus plus has nothing to do with any basic block or looping structure. There was an I, and at the end, it's added to one, and that's useful for the next go around. But at the moment, you don't care where the add happens. It's not really part of the, the meaning of the overall program. It's just part of the local value for I. And most of the program modifications um, don't care about basic blocks. I modify the control flow graph as freely as I modify the data graph, and that changes the implied control flow graph freely as well, but I don't pay any attention to the control flow graph until I'm very close to the end where I'll rebuild a structure that will turn into machine code you can run. There is some some picking out of a control flow graph. So a region implies a start, and an if implies an in, and not vice versa. Um, but it's mostly useful to ignore uh, basic blocks and control flow graphs. And if you're not into compiler theory, that didn't make any difference. Here's the data side of things. This is, looks like a data flow graph, pretty much directly. There's embedded math and embedded constants. 
there's dependencies where the, the semantics of the program flow, except for fee, which is unique to SSA form, and that just represents where some value, I sub zero, and the I on the back edge, which is I2, merged at a loop head, or at a control flow join point where an if split the control back around. There are no basic blocks, there's no variable names in the program, I don't need them at this point, I just need nodes and edges to represent the program. The program's blending control and data so that a call might produce control out and data out as well. And it turns out it produces out the state of memory, it produces a set of exceptions it can throw, a couple other things like that. And if we'll take in control of saying when, but also data value saying true or false, branch or don't branch. And then two different controls out. Boy, this is really painful to have these things on the floor here, huh? Um, and a return might take in a return value as well as the control saying when I'm going to go. Only edges order. Only edges carry the meaning of the program, the semantics, right? Comes from the edges, not from your program variable names. All the names you wrote in your program, they're all gone. From the JVM point of view, the bytecode names, which would be Things like uh, I, I pushed and popped and pushed and popped and stack slots, those are the names that I deal with. They're also gone. I just have nodes and edges. And in fact, I can move them around as long as I preserve the ordering on the edges. And so here I have shoved the plus of one and what I read from the command line out of the loop. And the times two of the result out of the loop down below. And I don't really care if they're in or out while I'm doing my optimizations because it makes no semantic meaning difference. There's a performance difference. Performance is handled later on this kind of code. This is code generation, code scheduling. During program semantics optimizations, don't care. Don't worry about it. So that's C of nodes IR in a nutshell. And if you're in a grad student course on uh, compile IR, uh, you know, this would be a week-long thing. Anyone else want to bail now? Because this is the level that the talk was intended for. And, and like I said, I'm all happy to stop and answer questions. So, okay, I'm going to carry on. So the compilers are built in a lot of passes. Um, and C2 being a major optimizing compiler has a lot of them, although fewer than the average optimizing compiler, I would say, by a fair amount. It's still got a lot for being fewer. Um, there's a pass to build it from bytecodes, which includes your inlining and a bunch of people optimizations, which I'll get to in just a second. And there's an iter pass, which is repeating people optimizations until there ain't no more to be done. What's a people optimization? It's a monotonic graph rewrite rule. Okay, so that's a lot of heavy words, so let me explain that in a second. Um, but you can imagine it being, I looked at my graph shape, I looked at a people on it, a small bounded region, I did a transformation that was locally correct without regards to anything else in the program. Just right, I see right here, I see an add of a zero, which I know is just the value itself. I don't need to actually add the zero. I do that transformation and I'm done. That's a people optimization. That's a graph rewrite rule. This includes dead code elimination. What's dead code? Code that's not necessary for the output. That's constant propagation. That would be adding two and three to get five and then don't do the add usually shows up in array addressing math because you always have the array base plus an offset for the, the object's header plus your index times the scaling factor. But your index is often i plus 1 or i plus 2 or minus 1 or whatever. So that also is a constant. You get a whole lot of constants that will get folded up. Fine. Common sub-expression elimination. That would be doing the same thing twice. So you said I load a field x, I load a field x, I load a field x. Well, I only need to load it once, keep it in a machine register. That's common sub-expression elimination. You probably use a getter. So there's a function call to get the x. And I have three function calls in a row, which hopefully got in line with a call and a thing and a return, and a call and a load and return. And they're all commons that get loaded away. Load store ops. Um, you store a value. Second later, you load from where you stored. Maybe after some inlining patterns. So that you didn't obviously store and load it directly. Can peel them apart. Um, I do store into a new thing. So you get a new, it gets free zeros, you store some more zeros in, then you store some other values in. I can totally do that new at the machine code level by filling in the values that are actually your, your initializer, your, your constructor does. Every kind of small optimization you can think of gets done by iter. And it's guaranteed to run in linear time. What does that mean? It means it guarantees that the 
time spent doing the iter pass is proportional to the amount of code I'm compiling, irregardless of the number of times I call iter, which is very unusual. Um, and that's because iter is the simple work list, and typically the work list is empty. Um, and because it has this property, it's run every time any other optimization is run to clean up afterwards. So all the other optimizations, like the loop optimizations, which do range check elimination, loop enrolling, like things that you would expect out of a Fortran compiler, um, or to get to Fortran code, uh, leave a lot of junk left in the graph when they're done, and iter cleans it out. Then there's uh, global code motion. That's a full latency aware, frequency aware uh, scheduler that does all the right things with placing code into basic blocks where you expect. Has to uh, include anti dependencies, which if you're not into compilers, you don't care. And I come back to having a control flow graph. I still have the sea of nodes as a graph directly, but I now label some of the nodes as being basic block heads or ends. I now officially have basic blocks. Uh, data ops are officially inside basic blocks, and I can no longer do simple peepholes because that might change what the basic block structure is. So there's a notion of code motion now, and there wasn't before. And so I have done all my optimizations that involve program semantics changing. Here I'm at a point where I'm just trying to emit code. So I place things in basic blocks, I generate code, that means pattern match the instructions into x86 or ARM or whatever you're coding for, do register allocation on them, and install in a JVM, and you're done. And you know, turn it on to the runtime, and the runtime can go execute. Lots and lots and lots of stuff in there. OK, so implementation of the compiler here. The, the, the Hotspot JVM is a big C++ program. As a big C++ program, you use C++ semantics, right? Which includes a virtual call, which, hot, which, which Java has the same technology to use its own virtual calls. Um, but you're using C++ vtable, and that carries the semantic meaning sufficient to describe the, the nodes. What, what is a node? Is it an add node, a call node, an if node, a less than, a multiply, a constant two, a constant five, whatever it's going to be. Um, there are about 35 virtual calls in the OpenJDK, you can go look, um, including the name of the thing, people optimizations, like what kind of rewrite rules do I have, how constant propagation works, a bunch of debugging prints, there's a ton of them, go look. Because I have this size and speed concerns, there's only a word of runtime type info, that's RTTI, and the edge arrays. So the arrays are a C++ object, you can't do the same thing in Java, they are embedded in the object as just a bunch of pointers in a row, and there's a, a length and a max, and a length and a max like an array list. So I have a microscopic version of an array list. It has a bunch of four byte pointers. It has, well, one byte of length and one byte of max because I don't get very big. Um, and then the same for the output array, and I'm done. So, so these, object, these nodes are actually quite small. There are explicit use def edges. What does that mean? I have a, I have a, a use and a def. This defines a value and this uses it. These are raw C pointers from use node to def node. Those are the unlabeled pointers. Order matters because A divided by B is not B divided by A. You can have null in those set of edges. That's common in the zero slot because the zero slot will carry the control dependence edge if you have to be control dependent, can't be moved upwards against that edge without breaking some semantics. For instance, divide by zero. Um, the output edges, def use edges, were added a little later in life for the compiler. They are an un unordered pile of edges, just an unordered list. The, the input edges are totally ordered. You can't change that order without changing program meaning. The output edges are unordered. You can reorder the list any way you like. It's often the case that I walk all of the output edges, and I don't care what order I, I walk them. It's often the case that all the output edges are being um, removed because I'm replacing one node with another. And so it's a, treated like a work list. So there's a bunch of macros in there to go execute over the output edges, uh, like array list lets you iterate over the members of an array list, except that there's versions that say work until it's empty, there's a work list, uh, work and allow concurrent modification, but do something with new things that show up. Be careful and know that new things showed up, you must visit them or you must not or work until things are uh, uh, changing, but if somebody modifies something that 
happened earlier, you already iterated over, you have to go handle that special or whatever. There's a bunch of different iterators for different cases. There's no concurrent modification exception here, but things are concurrently getting modified all the time. So there's semantic meaning to the how you handle the concurrent modifications baked into how you walk the output edges. But you can otherwise conceptually think of it as an array list with special iterator semantics. Peepholes, these are graph rewrite rules. I look at a local layer of the graph I, I, I write a version of the graph out on a, on a plane, on a piece of paper, draw a circle around a region. As long as I don't cut a node, just cut some edges. Look inside. If I see something obvious, I go make a transformation. No change outside that area. No looking outside that area. I don't know what's outside. So I must be locally correct inside this area. And that makes the rule simple. It has an obvious shape to the rules. It's easy to write. And I make a, a semantics preserving change so my neighbors don't know that I've changed. They're not aware of something happened. Monotonic here means I, I can't have a, a, a people that changes a graph and one that unchanges because they'll just compete with each other endlessly and I'll never stop, right? Um, most of these areas are, in fact, rooted at a single obvious node like this one. So the implementations, they're always a root. And you inspect, and he decides what the graph shape areas, and he mutates inside, and he lists the neighbors somehow so that I can tell what might be a useful place to go inspect for further peepholes. There are hundreds of these rules. Um, you can go look in the OpenJDK, go look at like add node, go in the opto directory to add node.cpp, and go find the ideal call, and they'll be listed. Hell, do this. So if an add, do constants. If an add of a constant and an add of a constant, then reshuffle and fold the constants. If it's this and this and one's a loop induction, then flip it so the loop induction is on the right, or the array mass on the left. Da, 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 da. There's there dozens of them in add alone, and again, for multiply and subtract and loads and stores, and on and on and on. You get a couple hundred. So iter. It's uh, repeating these peepholes in a pass. Pull a node from a work list, peephole if possible. If nothing was possible, you just toss them off the work list, you're done. If something was possible, you got his neighbors in that graph rewrite rule, throw them on the work list. Um, also, while you're doing this, check for constant propagation, global value numbering, that same as, as that global version of common sub-expression elimination, if you will, and dead code elimination, because they apply to all nodes uniformly, and I don't need to have every single node have uh, a graph rewrite rule for that guy. So these are global graph rewrite rules, and everyone has their own personal graph rewrite rules, and you run in a work list until the work list runs dry. Since the work list run dry, if somebody else changed something, they threw some neighbors on a work list, that's the only amount of work you have to repeat to know that you have all peepholes done all the time. Called all over the compiler, it's fast. Sum of all iter passes is linear in the size of the program. Let me mention a little bit about edges. Um, this is, gets into graph theory and compiler theory a little bit more, so you can like you know stop me or not, and I'll just blow through. Edges are direct pointers, as I mentioned before. Why? For speed. It's much faster to not bounce through. Uh, I don't know how many people know about performance, but every time you have a layer of indirection, the layer of indirection is about double to triple the cost of not having it. It's very substantial indirection costs. Okay. Um, because they're plain C pointers, they can't carry labels. Um, and I don't need to, typically, because USTEF edges are ordered already, and that ordering carries the meaning, and I don't need to know why the input to a divide on the left is the numerator or the denominator. The fact that it's in slot one or slot two tells me that info. But some nodes produce different kinds of outputs. And, and an if produces a false and a true out. And a call produces uh, the control that says the call completed. And then the return value is very different. And the state of memory updates that happened that the call mutated memory on. And an exception if thrown are all things that come out of a call. So a call has a bunch of projections. Why do I say projection? Because I declare these guys to be a tuple. They produce a collection of values. A fixed size known, fixed length in the compiler. Everyone gets length four, length two, whatever. And a projection has, I take slice zero, slice one, slice two, slice three. I take a projection of a tuple. And that's the value I'm using on that edge. So it basically it labels an edge, but only on the 5% of the time where I need a labeled edge. So it lets me keep my size and my speed in the 95% case. Compilers. Uh, talk about types a lot. And it's a big, big chunk of every compiler, including C2. You can imagine the program you're handed as the 
the story you're telling or the paragraph you're writing about. It's the big concept and ideal that you're working with. Types are the words in that paragraph. They are the units that make up the story. So uh, that's sort of a high-level analog. Uh, uh, mathematically, type is a set, set of values. And all the integers are all the floats, so it's not an infinite set, but it's a very, very large set. Um, but it can be a single float, or a class, or a null, or a particular string, or whatever. Every node has a type, and the types actually refine over time. Uh, there's a type called control for, for instance, region nodes and if nodes and the like. That represents execution of control. And there's, a, there's an on and off control. There's X control for you're not executing, or you're not executable. Which would happen if a test goes dead. One arm carries the control that carries on, and one arm can't execute, and so it goes dead. Um, there's a virtual call in the C++ sense, same as Java virtual call, that computes a new type based on the old types and the neighbors in the graph. All your program semantics come from your neighbors, plus your own execution semantic. So you look at your inputs, their types, you have a type now. The types are obviously used for constant propagation, because I can add two and three, but I can also do them for deciding I have a Boolean test that's true or false, so the test goes dead, or switches, or, or class hierarchy analysis. What's that about? I know the type of an object, but maybe I pass it through some other tests, and suddenly I can refine its type from object to, to integer to something specific, and then Class hierarchy analysis is when I look at, you said hash code on capital I integer. How many implementations are there of that? Oh, there's exactly one. So I can now inline it. But I couldn't do that if I only knew your type as capital N number. Right? As soon as I dropped it from number to integer, I improved my knowledge of what your target method was so I can inline the hash code. So class hierarchy analysis totally feeds off the typing system. And the typing system then lets it, class hierarchy analysis refine you down to a single call, which then I can inline and carry on with from there. Used all over the compiler uh, in many, many places. And this is what I was talking about before when I said I have uh, a stronger typing system than Java or a more expressive typing system than Java. So it's all your integer sizes. So there's bool, short, car, uh, int, long, float, double. That's all the obvious ones. There are ranges, because people screw around with small integer ranges all the time, especially 0 and not 0 for Boolean, or 0 and 1 for Boolean. But 0, 1, 2, 3 happens all over the place, so I track exact ranges. Sometimes it helps me uh, uh, sort out a switch directly or, or kill a range check that's not needed anymore. I also look at tuples and arrays of things, and instance objects with their fields, field by field, have type by type by type. Equivalence class aliasing just means that uh, if I don't know exactly what's going on, I break the, uh, of the set of memory updates going in the world, I break them up into equivalence classes, disjoint sets of things. I know that if you're touching field X of some object, that you're never touching field Y of any object. And I can tell them apart at that level. Um, pointers, which can be raw pointers, like unsafe. OOP would be an object-oriented programmer. Uh, pointer, same as a garbage collected, managed pointer. So managed pointers, instance arrays, capital K classes, not Java classes, but the reflective version internally used by the system to da 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 So exact and inexact, for instance, hash map versus linked hash map, tell those apart versus you know, exactly this guy and not any subclass or this plus subclasses. If you're interested more, there's a good paper there um, on what kinds of things you can express here and why it matters. Types, this has been the most heavy theory I'm going to get into here, and then I'll, I'll back away from theory. Uh, the types define a lattice. Um, and unless you're pretty far into compilers, the lattice theory, you probably haven't seen it, or, or you're heavy duty in mathematics. This is, a, this is very mathematical. There's a Wikipedia article here, it's pretty good. Um, when I say a lattice, it has this funny thing. I'll try to give you an intuition, and we'll walk away from the slide. There's a center line for constants, like 0 is a constant, 1 is a constant, 3 is a constant. I mean, we know what constants are. OK, bottom would be not a constant, and I don't know what the value is. It's some integer value. And because I don't know what it is, I have to honor how it gets made. I have to do the math. So somebody says 7 divided by 3, and I don't have the right constant propagation working, then I don't know what the answer is. It's just some number, and I have to treat it like an integer that I don't know. Where top is the inverse of that concept mathematically, it's all the constants all at once. 
and the compiler can choose which one it wants to use, right, as convenient. And it totally shows up in many of the major optimizations that run around. And I won't get into those for, for time and space for the audience here. Um, but that same notion of bottom and top and having a notion of, oh, I don't know what this is. I have to go compute it the hard way. And, oh, it's all possible choices all at once. And I can just pick as I choose. Extends to strings. Extends to Java instances, Java classes, the capital K classes, which then turn into the Java C classes you think of, and everything in between. And they're all in the same hierarchy all at once. Ultimately, I have a lattice which has a lot of mathematically well-specified, well-defined properties. becomes a Boolean algebra if you're into that sort of set of things. And it's necessary to be that logically refined, mathematically refined, in order to make these algorithms I'm using run fast, uh, I perfectly get this correct answer, every optimal correct answer every time, and, and in fixed time. So, so these properties are required, and that's part of engineering a good compiler, is unfortunately, there's a lot of math there. Type descriptions get big. So I'm talking about types, but I'm not. I'm gonna talk about implementation, and the technology I'm going to talk about here works for many, many things having nothing to do with types. This is a cool way to make shit run faster if you have the, the right kind of properties. So the types, um, I, I don't want to have lots and lots of big type descriptions. They're mostly the same. In any given program, there'll be a thousand unique variations on various types. And a million times, I'll ask for a type. But I only have a thousand or so, or millions and tens of millions. So I'm just going to have them be immutable and interned like you intern strings. And hash consing is a technology for interning structured objects. Um, once they're interned, I can compare them with equal equals, not dot equals. And in fact, if I compare them with dot equals and they have an interesting internal structure, I have to do a structural compare with dot equals, a recursive structural compare. I do that during the interning process, but not when I'm using them directly, because it's asymptotically slower to walk a large structure every time you do an equals test. In fact, when it's cyclic, it's just a crash. So it, it's a bug to use dot equals. Very different from the usual Java world. You must use equal equals. Um, but because most of them hit the hash cons table, the interning table, the actual count of memory being used by the sum of all the objects is fairly small. It all conveniently fits in your cache. So they're all running 10 times faster than if I was to actually not hash cons them, not intern them. It's usually faster this way. And then I mentioned before, the lattice is defined by meet and dual, which doesn't make a lot of sense. I can get the reverse join by doing a, a dual is going the other side of the symmetric lattice. It's symmetric, so dual is simply flipping. Um, you dual, dual, meet, and dual. So da da da, meet, and then flip again. And the isa is now meet with the, uh, uh, the other side. So I can say, isn't, is three an int? Is three a float? Yes, also. Is pi an int? No. Is uh, you know a string an int or or uh, you know a proj node person an instance of a of a linked list yada yada that all turns into a, a couple clock cycles to go do the test. Okay, pessimistic versus optimistic. It's another more easy to obtain piece of theoretical knowledge. Um, iter pass and the peepholes are all pessimistic. What does that mean? It means I start from a program state which is correct. As it stands, all by itself, I could generate code and run with it right away. It would work. I want to do a change that preserves the correctness. But I only look at a little tiny piece of the program, and I make a change that is locally correct, and the program as a whole remains globally correct. While I'm doing this, the types strictly lift over time. They become more and more refined. I discover constants where I didn't have constants known before. And that lets me do new things, usually uh, 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 kill dead if tests, which makes some code die, which makes a merge point go away, and I can discover more constants, and I lift again. And I repeat until I, I can't find anything new. Global constant propagation does it from the other direction, sort of mentally. I'm going to start from that top point, that everything's my best possible choice point. But the program's not correct in that state, because there are conflicts between what I'm starting from and what any of the, the, the program semantics would do. So the value calls look at my inputs, which are all like stupidly high, and say, oh, this is the new output. 
And they fall over time. Strictly fall, become more and more coarse, and more and more often they fall to bottom, and I have to actually compute the value. And when I quit falling, the conflicts are resolved, and I have a correct program. For the typing system, uh, global constant propagation is monotonically better. What does that mean? It is never worse than iter. It might be tied, but in practice, it's usually a lot better than iter. And this would be necessary every time I have to work my way around any kind of looping or recursion. And then I discover something smarter about the types. Uh, yes, I find constants like null and not null. That happens. It's interesting. The much more interesting one is I will refine the types of your Java class object pointers or whatever. And that will let me, in turn, refine what the heck's going on with them and who's calling what and why. It has a funny implication, which is the, the, the call which computes new types from old types for both iter and GCP. Um, in one pass, the types are strictly lifting. In the other pass, they're strictly falling, although the falling guy usually always he can never fall below. He usually falls above before he stops, which means the value calls have to be monotonic, as well as the typing system doing meet and join have to be monotonic, um, which has this funny property here, which I guess I probably won't go into. There's a bunch of papers here. Um, which can give you a lot more intuition as to why that's important and how it works. This is the, these properties turn into it runs in constant time with it giving you a provably optimal answer. Inlining. How does inlining work? So again, we're only going to have time for a high-level overview. Some execution in the interpreter hits the 10,000 limit, triggers a compile. Hey, this method's hot. You need to compile it. OK, most of the time that method that's hot needs to get compiled, that's a getter. That's a one load instruction get. OK, that's not useful to compile. You need some context. So I crawl a stack looking for a better spot to go start the compilation. right? So you hunt down until you decide, this is a good spot. And then you begin parsing bytecodes here. But as you parse the bytecodes, you come across call sites. And as you come across call sites, you want to inline. And you're going to inline as you parse. That requires you to do CHA, class hierarchy analysis, to decide if I even know what the hell I'm going to call and therefore what target method I'm going to inline, which requires me to run my peepholes as I parse to get the refined knowledge of what the this pointer is so I know who it is I'm calling. And then once I decide I know who I'm calling and I can tell that I, that I have a target method I can inline, then I have some heuristics to say when what. One of them is, you know, the main one is mostly it's small and it's already hot itself. What does hot mean? It means the counters have been kept in the interpreter and the counts are pretty big. Eh, hot enough. Size is literally byte, count of byte codes. Small byte codes, hot enough counts, inline. There's some always. That would be the trigger method must be inline because that's the whole reason I'm here. Um, but your, your intrinsics must be inline because the JIT does magic stuff to intrinsics. Um, there's some Java text for the intrinsic that's like blown away and ignored, and here is what I'm actually going to do is it's substituted, but that only works if you're inline, and then it's hugely better than what the Java semantics say. Unsafe gets inline, some trivial methods get inline. Specifically, you have to not inline things that are larger and already compiled, or else you, you uh, well, it's iCache blowout. What's iCache blowout? Your, your iCache on your processor runs out of memory, runs out of space, and you're constantly swapping on your iCache, and you, you slow down by factors of 4 to 10. It's pretty gro gruesome. Um, what it really means is that I'm tiling the entire call execution graph with compilation units. And if I take some big method, and I inline it here, and I inline it again here, and I inline it in this here, and here, and here, and here, then I have 12 different versions of the same big method. All 12 have to live in my iCache and I run out of iCache space, and that's the blowout. But a big method that already been compiled, there's not a whole lot more gain to inlining it. Small methods inline into bigger ones, there's a good gain. Pretty big method into a big method, not so much gain. Just pay the call costs. So fine. So the inlining decisions are made at bytecode parse time, which is often too early, because it lacks the detailed optimizer knowledge. I get the peepholes, but I don't get my good frequency analysis that I get later in the compiler. I don't get it as precise uh, uh, this type. I don't get knowledge of like arguments that are constant, say null, because there's a lot of methods that would be very large, but they start with, if argument is null, return null. And then I would love to inline that, because that would just go away, right? So there's some hit or miss on inlining, which is typically compensated by over inlining, by inlining more than maybe you'd think would be useful. 
There's global code motion as a pass, which builds a real control flow graph. It unwinds the C in the C of nodes and makes basic blocks. It's a full global latency aware, frequency aware scheduler, does every kind of C and Fortran y you know, buzzword thing you would imagine there. Codes move out of loops, it's into low frequency branches. Uh, de optimization is a thing I'll talk about in a minute. Um, it requires anti dependencies, which is another pass, which I won't go any more into. But when I'm done, the IR is fragile. I can't do my peepholes anymore because I have to do basic block aware transformations, and I didn't bother. I got all those done already. I'll never do them again. There's a global, there's, I'm sorry, there's a graph coloring register allocator. Um, a lot of people will jump up and down and say, hey, we use a linear scan. It's so much faster. Um, this is probably the single slowest phase in the compiler, but it's also responsible for the greatest speed up across junk Java code. If you have a hot, tight loop, there are certain things you want to do a little special. He does it, and linear scan guys get away with it as well. But if you have big piles of big junk code, the graph coloring allocator wins every time by a lot. It's also robust to that over inlining problem I mentioned a second ago. So if I have a call site where this method calls over to that method, the call instruction is like a hardware call. It's a clock, and there's a return at the end. It's one clock. And there's a prologue and epilogue, which looks like spill a bunch of registers to memory and load them back up. Those spill instructions at piles of store and loads, that's the cost of making a call, not the one clock in and out. So the allocator arranges to have the spill cost to be almost exactly the same as if you didn't inline it, or you, you, you yeah, you didn't inline it. Um, and that's a hard trick to do, which at the time I did it, like no one else on the planet was doing that, I had many, many static compilers I've used and worked on where one good spill deserves another, you run out of registers, you spill one, but you're still out of registers, so you spill again, you spill again, you spill again, and pretty soon you're, you're drowning in spill code, your performance goes to hell in a handbasket, so the engineers writing those compilers would just turn back on inlining, so they quit hitting it. And so they would sort of try to creep up to this performance curve by adding more and more inlining, but if they fell off, they fell off hard, so they were conservative, not so C2, we aggressively inline, and the allocator makes sure it works, and that's its own hour-long talk and responsible for one of the reasons why Java is good. Um, OK, I'm going to go a little faster. Some specific optimizations. These are kind of uh, obvious in what they're doing. I got repeated null checks. Well, you know, this one's dead because you already passed that test. Um, no difference between user null checks and those baked into the bytecodes. So if you write a null check, it gets the same treatment as a Java bytecode null check. In particular, most of them are removed during uh, uh, parsing, people parsing, 90%, disappear at the bytecode parse time before you get any of the other optimization passes. Of the remaining, half go as a, a explicit branch and half go as a hardware memory check. There's a load or store op that might seg fault, and there's a lookup table for the seg fault to say, oh, it's actually a Java null pointer exception. Compilers of that error didn't have to deal with all the null checks Java did, so they didn't do the, the, the transformation. Here's one that's kind of fun, it's unzipping. I have a, a zip set of control flow. Test for null, do something, merge. Test for null, test again, it, it's a closed zipper. But if I just clone C and F, I can unzip and do this. Now I have a long straight line of code to optimize over. There's a lot more room for improvement. This lead test will do the branch or the load according to whether it fails more or less. But if it never fails at all, I'll just cut it off. I'll deopt. I mentioned that several times before. What is deopt? Go to the interpreter. Don't bother me now. Then this is the only path, and there's no merge here at I. It's still straight line code. Everything that got hard, you throw off to the interpreter. Class hierarchy analysis, about 90% of your calls fall to class hierarchy analysis, which in turn means they get inlined or can be inlined, become a static call. Maybe there's a guard test. The remaining 10% use a technology called an inline cache. In the code, in the machine code, literally machine code, there's a cache with a key and a value. You look at the one entry at the key, you load compare test in one clock cycle, and if you hit, then you do the second clock cycle is the call, which is the value, is the target method that you want the call to go to. That covers 99% of, of remaining things. Of the few remaining V calls that fail, uh, uh, the inline cache fail that check. If they failed it once, they'll fail it all the time through the program. The call goes what we call megamorphic. You actually have a virtual call going to multiple targets. You have to do it the hard way. Load, 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 jump register. It's about 30 clocks even on a fast x86. It's 30 times slower than other kind of call. 
say what it is. Range check elimination, I'm running out of time, I'm going to skip. Check cast instance of a race store is a fun paper on. It almost always turns into a load compare branch. Maybe I can give you a quick intuition. I want to know if some unknown object on my left-hand side is an instance of a string. Well, I have a class hierarchy just from object to whatever to string. I think strings right off object. But you can imagine a class hierarchy as a, a tree of classes rooted at object. String is some depth down that. My object on my left, I don't know what class it is, but I don't care. I have a table of all his, his, his path from where he's at in the class hierarchy to object. So the table says I'm object, and I'm number, and I'm integer, let's say. String has depth one. I look up depth one in this table over here. I come up with number, not string. You're not an instance of. That's the way the test usually goes. It's one clock, load compare branch. x86 eats that up, does it in a clock cycle. Heroic optimizations. Most of the Java safety checks rarely fail. Um, but if they do fail, they'll tend to fail again and again and again, so they have to work well if they're going to fail. So these things like race stores, range checks, null checks, paths never taken yet. I'm going to heroically assume that they're never going to fail. I'm going to generate code that way. But I'm going to leave some breadcrumbs to find my way back if they do fail. So if I'm running well in the fast case, I do some quick check, and then away I go until I crash. And I hit the bad case. What do I do? Unwind to the interpreter. Literally repack the stack frames containing the running, executing Java state as jitted out by the compiler into a set of interpreted frames representing the inlining that the compiler had done. Record a failure bit. Hey, don't do this bad thing because it's bad. Reprofile, rerun the interpreter. You go to walking speed for a little while. You, 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 after you profile, you get to rejit but now with a failure bit set. So you're not quite so heroic the second compilation around, and then you're back to running full speed. But now you have code generated for the bad thing. What is deoptimization? It's the backup plan in a, in a high philosophical point of view. It's the recovery option for every failure. Just go back to the interpreter. Don't try to do everything in the compiler because it's too hard to generate code for too many things. I will totally do fast path for allocation. I will load compare branch that I didn't run out of space. I'll add the pointer. I'll say I got a piece of memory. That's really quick, but I am not writing a garbage collector on the compiler. So if I fail that test, you go off to the garbage collector. You bail out right here and now. OK, that's done by safe points. Safe points aren't put in anywhere. They're put in just in fixed locations. And every time you're taking a fast running Java program and you want to stop at the debugger, it will run forward to a safe point because the machine code has no mapping to any Java state until and only at safe points. So in between safe points, there is no Java state in any sensible way. It'll map from the machine's registers, the machine stack and memory, whatever, to the Java execution machine. And then you can break that out into the debugger. These are not really related to GC safe points, but the two were overloaded because that was the implementation strategy. But they have no other reason to be overloaded. So from the compiler's point of view, a safe point is like a rarely taken call that happens to read all of memory. OK. Um, so I'm going to treat it like that. In fact, calls are an instance of safe points, and safe points are just a node in the graph with a use def edge to every JVM state, which forces it to keep alive, and it's flagged with a very low execution frequency so that the schedulers do all the right thing, and the safe point goes off to some side path, and the bits you need for the interpreter, but not the jitted code, also go off to the side path. So as any times you take these deops and you bail out, or you've taken a debugger hit and you want to stop or whatever, you take a funny low frequency branch, you execute some code that does a bunch of cleanup from the JVMs from the jitted state to build the interpreter state, because like I said, the JIT doesn't need a lot of things the interpreter does. And, and you get great code in the fast path, but you can still unwind and recover. OK, I'm going to skip this, because you guys aren't debugging C2. And we're going to wind it out here. C of nodes. It's this program semantics as a graph. Um, keep it small for speed. I actually really love the notion of doing these graph react rules. They make writing and optimizing compiler way the heck easier. There's all kinds of cool things you do in those rewrite rules that because they are local and locally correct, you don't have to reason about the whole program at all. You can stare at a small piece, know in your head the obvious thing, add of 0 is 1, and multiply by 1, divide by da da da. They're all obvious. Types. 
Um, there's a complex theory behind them, but they define what a compiler can talk about. And if I can't talk about null pointers, for instance, I can't do null pointer optimizations. That's a big one. There's a lot of Java-specific optimizations that showed up in C2. These days, they're common. You know, JavaScript does half of these things, too. But at the time I did this stuff, brand new, down the line. A lot of aggressive inlining made up for by a very uh, expensive graph calling allocator, um, which does a great job at letting you write code that can run fast. So, um, you know, the compiler's been around a while, more than 20 years. There's some cruft in 20-year-old code, but the bones of it remain. It, it, it is what I just described. Um, and if you're a practicing C2 engineer, what I said today should be sensible still. Like, you know what I'm talking about. It's a labor of love. There I am 20 years ago. Java 1 Japan. And here's the resources. And that's it. I'm done. I think I'm out of time, too. So I got told. Right. So I'll hang, yeah, questions. Yeah, fire. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, uh, I want to ask about the slide when you was talking about um, like this uh, optimization uh, with failure, with failure bit. Yeah, I'm uh, getting there. You said that you like you set the failure bit to true if there was some failure, but I wanted to ask if uh, mm, I missed, didn't I? What if I'm like okay with this like long failure pass? Uh, I want to always run like very fast, in, yep. Uh, yep. and I don't want to bother with. Right, I, I understand. So, so what happens is your program did something that the, the was no code was jitted for. So you pay a cost to throw the exception, which often will fault into the OS and then come back as a context double context switched. Table look up at what the exception meant. Decide that we cannot carry on in the jitted code. So unpack the stack into the interpreter and begin interpreting. So you're now running slow. So your code's running slow at some frequency of the time. The test that got skipped at this point is often only a couple of clock cycles long to actually do a, a correct test. Plus the jitted code for that may be horrible or slow or whatever. So let's talk about that in a second. So to make this make sense from a performance point of view, the frequency of your failure has to be low enough, but it's not zero or we wouldn't have bothered, right? It has to be low enough that the cost to double context switch in and out of the OS plus repack the stacks plus run in the interpreter while to get back to some jaded code at a later point has to be faster than the one or two clocks I shaved by not bothering in the first place. So you have to have many million to one failure mode rate on these tests for that to make sense. And the gain you'll get for this generally will be a handful of clocks uh, multiplied by their frequency, whatever location they're at, which is typically never going to make up for having a deopt at all. So almost without exception, I won't say never, but almost without exception, you're better off rejetting the code. That, like I said, the, the circumstances where you win by failing every time failing are really tiny. You have to have very specific instances there. Uh, well, if you don't mind, I have a few questions. Um, so first of all, the boundaries of the peepholes. So how do you choose them? So what's the criteria? Well, by what you intend to accomplish with a peephole, right? So this case, I know that I'm doing something stupid with add of zero. So the, the boundary is very obvious. I, I need to catch everything that's an input to the add and everything that's an output from the add. Those are the, that's, the, that's the border. That'll be the neighbors that may get modified here. But that's the boundary. So if I'm doing uh, something like, oh, you know, da, 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 the, the unzipping, I don't have another in-between sized one. So the unzipping one, the boundary got bigger. Here, typically, this test says, what's this? Well, it turns out I have an incremental dominator tree. If you're not into compilers, you know what that means. Never mind. I jumped right here and said, oh, I have another one of these tests. I have a test and a test. Well, what's the size of this? Oh, it's not very big. So this is a peephole right here. Now, not P at all. This. I do this, 
into the version here. Actually, let's do this into the version where I do the test one. No, here. Yeah, here, here. This. I keep this one. This guy goes away. These stay put. This gets cloned, and, and, and then I'm done, right? So, so that's a version of a peephole right there, and I start from here, and I do this. Then in the second time, it's this guy with this, because this is gone, and I do it in the same peephole again. So I don't unzip with a special unzip option. I do local unzip only, and they just repeat back to back. That's the kind of thing that goes on there. So there's a few other ones. Like a lot of array addressing math hacks come into play where you have an induction variable, plus or minus a constant, times the, the, the stride, plus the array base, plus maybe something else. And I want to reorder those so the constants all come together. So every add has, if I have a constant on my left and a non-constant on my right, flip it. That's completely local. So after everyone's done with those, if I have an add and an add, and on my left I see the add with a constant on the right, so it's a little bigger people, it has a two adds with a two constants, fold it, right? These, this is your, your head thinking, how do I generate better code? You're just staring look, little tiny pieces of program. Oh, this is a stupid thing. I just shift it this way, and it's a little better. That's what they all look like. Um, OK. Maybe you can add a few words comparing the crawl compiler. Gr crawl? Yeah, so, so the, the crawl guys started long after I did. They wanted to rewrite because they felt C2 was getting too ugly internally. And they switched over to writing it in Java. And you know, given where the world has come today, I think that's a good decision. So uh, a, a fresh rewrite of a C2 style. They're using the same kind of graph IR. I mean, it's not, this is C++ versus Java, but semantically, mentally, you can think it's the same kind of thing. Um, the, the, you know, I think that's a great idea. Implementation-wise, C2 has been battle-hardened for many, many years. It has also stalled out doing some things that I did at Azul you know, a decade later that would have fixed the shortcomings with Scala. But if you look at the broad spectrum of things, not just Scala, but everybody, C2 is still reliably on par or above. Like, Gua will hit performance potholes where I fix this in C2, and there are really no places where C2 fails. But there's some places where it doesn't necessarily do spectacular, but it will always do something reasonable. Gua still has some spectacular fails. So what that means is, your performance with Grawl is irregular. It's sometimes better and sometimes worse, and where it's worse, it's much worse. If you're specifically doing Scala, you're probably better off with Grawl. If you're not specifically doing Scala, you probably will not get a gain from Grawl, but you might get a loss. And if you're an engineering manager looking at a large project and pondering the, the cost-benefit trade-off, um, you're less likely to win with Grawl compared to the costs of recovering the failures in the field when it potholes on you, right? So it's not the battle-hardened warhorse yet. Um, but performance-wise, where it doesn't fall over, it's on par with C2. So I think they'll, they'll cross that threshold at some point where it will be a safe, from a manager's point of view, call to choose Grawl. If specifically you're doing Scala, you should look at Grawl now. But if you're not Scala, most of the conservative managers I know won't touch it yet. No, it's not there. But engineering-wise, you know, performance, if you're not in a pothole, it's pretty close. OK. And what about LLVM? Will we see any optimizations which are like, like I don't know, hundreds of thousands there? I we'll don't track LLVM. So I, I know a bunch of people do things with LLVM. Um, I know they've been working for a long time. I, it wasn't appropriate. It wasn't available when I started. It wasn't appropriate a decade ago. I don't know where they're at now. I don't track LLVM. I just heard that in Azul, in the... the, the I, I know that Azul's doing it. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know they're trying it. I, I actually don't know. I've asked a couple times. I'm not getting really solid answers out. I don't know how well their LLVM port compares to C2. I see. Okay, thanks. I'm done. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah, thank you for presentation. So you've mentioned that the C2 type system is a superset of the Java ones. Yeah. So were you inspired by some specific type system when you designed that? I was a grad student at Rice working my way through types, doing constant propagation. And as an early part of my grad student years, I did a deep dive into 
why the lattice theory works and, uh, and followed by the, the actual PhD thesis um, on combining optimizations was expressing common sub-expression uh, 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 elimination and um, global constant propagation, including control flow constant propagation and standard constant propagation into a single unified framework starts by expressing everything in a lattice the way the types are in. It's a very unusual lattice that I actually didn't do for Java, but I had a bunch of experience as a grad student. So while I'm a very proficient distributed systems engineer with all kinds of things, I have like a pretty deep understanding of mathematics here on this piece of mathematics. Um, that was my inspiration. It came from my grad student days studying uh, pretty much very theoretical uh, lattice theory math, which I don't know, that was normal. I just like, oh, this is kind of fun. Kind of rat-holed into it. Okay, I think we're out of time. I'm getting told that we have to you know, evict I will be around. Um, I don't know, is there, is there a discussion point place for people to go? Or I said just go out in the main room, people follow me and we'll find a corner. That's, I'll head out in the room, follow if you have more questions, we'll find a quiet corner. And thank you very much.